Okay, and hello everybody. So today I'm joined with Luca Miriman from GMIT and he's going to talk to us today about genetic screening um, for bivalves and crustacean larvae. So Luca, could you introduce yourself and GMIT a little bit please? Certainly. Um, GMIT, a Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, is uh, located in Galway on the west coast uh, of Ireland. Uh, and nested within the, the institute, we have a marine and freshwater research center, which hosts uh, up to 70 researchers, uh, including postgraduate students, doing research on a wide range of uh, fields from uh, mostly aquatic, so marine and freshwater, but there's also other applications. Uh, as for myself, um, I originally from Italy. I graduated in, uh, in Ferrara University in 2002 and then uh, after uh, traveling a bit I, I came to Ireland in 2003 um, to start a PhD in UCC in Cork uh, and uh, I guess I, I got stuck in Ireland since and uh, uh, I've been since then I completed a PhD in 2007. I did go abroad for, for a few years I was in South Africa as a postdoctoral researcher uh, but essentially since the PhD I've been working as a researcher in, on a range of number of product of projects that they're mostly focusing on uh, marine life and using genetic tools. Uh, so developing the genetic uh, protocols and, and applications to study a wide range of, of um, questions uh, from ecosystem health to um, aquaculture and sustainable production of seafood. Uh, so we work on fin fish uh, mostly uh, and including other species as well. Um, and then since 2015, uh, I've been employed as a lecturer in aquatic ecology in GMIT. Excellent. OK, so could you tell us a little bit about the innovation or the techniques that you're working with at the moment, please? Yeah, so the, the, the specific project I want to talk about today is, is it aims at, at, um, at developing and applying novel genetic tools to aid the monitoring of shellfish and crustacean larvae around the Irish coast. Mm -hmm. So genetic methods can provide a rapid and unbiased way to screen large number of environmental samples such as plankton for the presence of larvae of species of interest. So the various mussels, oysters, uh, lobsters and so forth. So in particular, recent technological advances, uh, such as high throughput quantitative real-time microfluidic platforms and metabar coding. So there's a lot of fancy technology, but essentially these new tools that the technologies they, they have allowed the they show great potential to characterize marine biodiversity and detect genetic signals of target organisms with unprecedented sensitivity and specificity. And, and this complement other non-molecular tools, such as microscopy, which is still necessary in order to gather additional information from environmental samples, such as developmental stages and abundance. And so by using a multidisciplinary approach, it is therefore becoming possible now to obtain more data at an unprecedented frequency. Okay, so this is slightly off the questions that I've already um, listed for you, but is it similar or different to ED, eDNA? So eDNA stands for environmental DNA, uh, which uh, essentially it, it refers to any DNA that has left the source organism. So this could be cells uh, that are uh, lost by, by a fish, for instance, uh, as it swims through the water column, or they are excreted through feces, uh, so they would come from, for instance, from the intestine or other uh, tissues, or even simply lost by the gills while breathing. Uh, and, and this cells then will start breaking down and DNA will be uh, in dilution in water, uh, in the water column also for some time and in, until eventually it will break down and disappear. So it will persist in the environment for uh, it has been estimated in the case of coastal marine environment up to two weeks, but it can be even longer depending uh, on the environment. Um, so that is environmental DNA. So the, the tools we are detecting, we are developing are highly sensitive. So they can actually detect environmental DNA, yeah. uh, but also where we are trying to develop and, and 
and basically that's where the actual research is, is happening, is to be able to tell apart from presence of environmental DNA, so a genetic signal of the presence of a species of the adult population versus the presence of actual viable larvae. Uh, so in a way, in this case, in, in this application, the environmental DNA becomes more like a, a background noise of a population being there. Whenever we have spikes of genetic signals in a sample, there may be indicator, indicators of spawning events, for instance. Okay, okay. So why is your work of interest to Irish aquaculture producers? Well, you see, understanding patterns of, and, uh, of spawning and seed recruitment of shellfish around the Irish coast is a key is key to enable targeted, sustainable, and productive use of natural resources such as mussels. So, re reproduction, larval development, settlement of shellfish depend on many environmental and biological factors, and they are highly variable in the wild throughout time. Uh, and there's still so much thing we don't, so many things we don't know. So, monitoring such factors can be costly and time-consuming. And, and which is one of the reasons why many knowledge gaps still exist. Yeah. So therefore, genetic tools, they can, they can complement existing monitor protocols to provide the information at the time and the spatial scales that are required to support the Irish shellfish industry in making evidence-based choices, allowing for better planning of seed fishing, relaying to ultimately improve production tonnage. Okay. So You've already mentioned that monitoring is already in place, but how does your work compare with other solutions? Um, the novelty of the tools that we are developing is in the use of recent molecular technologies that, that boost the scale and the throughput of processing of samples while lowering the cost and time of processing. So right. the technique itself, you know, the molecular techniques itself, themselves, they are not new. But the way they're applied and with new technologies, we can actually upscale now the throughput and the cost of processing. So that's where uh, what we are doing is new. And, and the novelty of this approach comes from several components. So one in particular is the establishment of a dedicated reference DNA database for Irish shellfish and crustaceans of interest. Mm -hmm. So this is something that is unprecedented, for instance. At the moment, the, the amount of available inf genetic information from what we are trying to study, the targets, the organisms, it's, it's limited for Ireland. Uh, and, and that's what we need to bulk up to, to increase the amount of genetic information that is, will cre cre create a baseline of data that then we can use to compare our future findings and, and to, improve, uh, uh, to improve the resolution power of the tools we are developing. And then the other aspect is the development of high throughput pipelines capable of screening samples for many target organisms at the same time without the requirement of specialized taxonomics ex expertise. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the latter, uh, this one is, will be pursued using two main approaches, namely microfluidics and metabarcoding. I'm not going to go into detail, obviously, on, on those uh, techniques and, and those approaches, but Microfluidic platform or an analytical pipeline in, in, in a nutshell is, is essentially developing a, a set of species specific probes that will detect the presence of a, a species a DNA in a sample. But with the microfluidic platform we have uh, in GMIT now, we can upscale the throughput and test tens if not more species at the same time from one sample when we run it. So the, the throughput capacity is, is boosted significantly and the sensitivity is really, really high. Okay. Uh, so it's like looking for a needle in a haystack approach. Hmm. Whereas the metabar coding takes a more general approach. So from the same sample, it produces a, a, a profile of hundreds, if not even thousands of species from one water sample. And that could be a quite broad range of, of organisms from, from algae, seaweeds to invertebrates and vertebrates and so forth. Uh, and this one generally is less sensitive than uh, the other approach, but it can provide a generally a, a, a view of the community profiles, also of variants or other uh, species that uh, uh, were not expected in some cases. And, and these genetic signatures can be detected for really many, many species in one, from one single sample. Okay, so what's next for this project? So, what the, the in, in 
in, uh, in theory and in practice, this, this project, uh, this approach has been already shown to be successful at detecting presence absence of a species. If the DNA is there, most likely we'll, we'll, we'll detect it. All we have to do is just to make sure that whenever we get a signal, it is from the species we are trying to monitor. Uh, so that we're very confident that that will, uh, by the end of this project, it, uh, which is expected to, com to conclude at the end of 2020, to have a set of tools for a number of key species that will be confirmed uh, uh, and, and able to detect the presence of those species in the sample. What we are uh, now working on and what's needed next is, first of all, to define a threshold where we can say these are viable larvae versus just background signal DNA. Yeah. And then beyond that, there is also the aspect of trying to correlate the strength of the genetic signal with the relative abundance or biomass of the target organism um, or relative change in signal over time, which again can be a, a proxy or an indicator of spawning events, for instance. Um, as for trying to use genetics to identify different developmental stages, that's still very uh, early days. Uh, it would be difficult to figure out how to do that, but there are things we are doing today that 10 years ago we couldn't imagine that was possible. So, you know, in 10 years, in five years time, 10 years time, maybe it will also be possible to tell how many larvae, how many are two weeks old, how many are four weeks old from a sample and maybe even do it in the field. So are you currently working with any um, sea, uh, seafood producers or any anyone within the community at the moment or do you plan to? Well the, the project at, at, the, at, at the moment is the stage of development of the project is it's an early development stage so it's at the research and development stage so we are mostly uh, working with BIM yeah. uh, to with, who are basically coordinating and funding this, this research which is financed by the uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund uh, but BIM essentially is in contact with a range of stakeholders uh, as part of this project. In fact, uh, it, it is uh, in a way can be seen as a, a, almost like a, a citizen science pilot study whereby uh, fish farmers and other uh, operators and users around the Irish coast are collecting sam plankton samples uh, uh, fortnightly for a number of locations and they are sending them by post to us in GMIT and then okay. we process them further. So uh, BIM is in this case the let's say the channeling that that uh, relationship. But uh, at the moment is in the research and development stage. But eventually this could expand and extend to directly with a number of, of users in the field and and producers basically who, who are essential because they are in the field every day. They know the environment. They they are on site and if provided with the resources that can. Uh, easily take samples that can be sent for to GMIT or other labs for, for processing. So definitely this project is already showing that uh, the involvement of the, the stakeholders and producers in the field will be key in the implementation of these tools. Great, that's great. And so where can the Irish industry find out more, please? Well, the GMIT and MFRC, so the Marine Freshwater Research Centre websites, uh, we are currently updating those. The websites are, are generally uh, often obsolete in general because there is a lot of the recent information is not there, but we are, we are actually updating it as we speak. So I would expect that within the next couple of weeks, uh, the, our website will be fairly up to date uh, about this project and other projects that I'm in currently involved in. Um, other ways of knowing more about this is by contacting myself by email, uh, luca.mirmin at gmit.ie, uh, or approaching the AM, essentially. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Have you got anything else to add on that, or are you happy? I'm very happy. Um, I'm really excited about these applications, and I'm really looking forward to see what the final results will be. But we're really obtaining some interesting results from screening samples we obtained in 2019. So I think I think there's uh, these are exciting times for uh, molecular research to to be able to participate and contribute to uh, productivity and seafood production, and, and try to improve our knowledge 
on uh, on the marine uh, environment. That's great. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you indeed for your time as well. Thank you. Speak soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.